Thank you for joining us today for an important conversation in which expert panelists will help us understand the added risk of the COVID-19 pandemic and its <clears throat> risk at already at risk genocide, uh, what am I trying to say? It poses to populations already at risk of genocide and crimes against humanity at the hands of their government. My name is Rohini Har and I'm a medical advisor at Physicians for Human Rights. I'm honored to fill in for PHR's executive director, Donna McKay, today in introducing the webinar and our moderator. I could not be more pleased to share that today's conversation is the 21st in PHR's webinar series, which explores the implications of the pandemic through the lens of health and human rights. We have almost 400 people live with us today. Today, we will hear from panelists as they discuss the added threat of COVID-19 and what it introduces to populations of authoritarian states whose governments could use the pandemic as an opportunity to commit mass atrocities um, or deny certain populations their right to health while the world's attention is elsewhere, with a particular focus on the situation facing ethnic minorities in Myanmar. This is an especially important time to discuss this issue. Next week marks the third anniversary of crimes against humanity against the Rohingya people. I had the opportunity to travel there for PHR's forensic mission almost three years ago, and I'll never forget how, what was going on there and how little folks knew about what was happening when I returned. With attention turned to COVID now, I can only imagine that it's getting worse. The Rohingya are among many populations acutely at risk of further persecution during this pandemic. Whether it's the Uyghurs in China, conflict in Northwest Syria, or a near total lockdown continuing in Kashmir, we already know that war crimes and crimes against humanity have not abated because of the pandemic. There are many places I'm sure that we've not even heard of. I am humbled to welcome our expert panel today who will discuss the steps needed to prevent mass atrocities, the responsibility to protect these at-risk populations and the right to health during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we're fortunate to have with us um, Ambassador Stephen Rapp to moderate. Ambassador Rapp is the Sonia and Harry Blumenthal Distinguished Fellow for the Prevention of Genocide at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide. He's also former ambassador at large for war crimes issues and head of the Office of Global Criminal Justice at the U.S. State Department. He's also a PHR board member. As ambassador at large, he was responsible for advising the Secretary of State and the Undersecretary for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights on issues related to war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide, and formulating US policy relating to preventing, responding to, and securing accountability for mass atrocities. Prior to his appointment, he served as prosecutor for the Special Court for Sierra Leone, where he led the prosecution of former Liberian President Charles Taylor for atrocities committed during Liberian Civil War. Ambassador Rapp, thank you for leading our conversation today. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Rohini. It's a great pleasure to, to be uh, with this group uh, today and, and to be welcoming about 400 uh, uh, participants in this uh, 21st seminar on the COVID pandemic and, and health and, and, and human rights. Uh, we all know that during a pandemic, uh, governments uh, must respond uh, to protect public health and do it through actions that are, that are justified, proportionate, and respectful of human rights. However, we see some governments that have weaponized the COVID pandemic uh, to essentially uh, uh, justify authoritarian actions uh, to weaken and destroy opposition, including members of disfavored or excluded ethnic or religious groups. In Myanmar, that weaponization has been documented in a recent report of Progressive Voice, headed by our colleague Ken Omar. As the Myanmar military, not public health authorities, but the military has been put in charge of the COVID response, and they have brought to it their usual doctrine, often characterized in, as, as the four cuts, uh, that always involves deprivations of civilians to counter real or perceived security threats. This has included banning communications by civil society organizations, uh, arguing that this would be fake news, uh, even when it's accurate news about what's happening with the pandemic, interfering uh, with civil society organizations' ability to provide humanitarian assistance. In fact, uh, uh, for, uh, putting up uh, roadblocks and stopping and arresting people, saying uh, 
uh, that in fact that assistance in aid is in aid of, of terrorists. And at the same time that they're, they're doing that kind of blocking of, of, of communication and, and, uh, and, and community activism, uh, we still have the, the military and, and those associated with it engaged in, in hate speech of their own, such as through the, uh, uh, the Piedong Su Tat Magal, or Union Military Facebook page, which carried messages like that posted as, as, as uh, hashtag Min Din on April 12th, asserting that COVID-infected Muslim Rohingya civilians, referred to derisively as Bengalis, as foreigners, were being secretly smuggled uh, by a terrorist group from their camps in Bangladesh back into Myanmar to spread the virus. Now, PHR itself has been active in documenting human rights violations in Myanmar, as Rohini described, including gathering evidence relevant to genocidal intent and in the Myanmar military's clearance operation launched three years ago this month that drove more than 700,000 Rohingya into Bangladesh. Today, we brought together a panel of experts to discuss this alleged weaponization of the pandemic in Myanmar, uh, done uh, potentially as a means to commit human rights violations. I'd now like to introduce our panelists. The first panelist is uh, Yi Tung, uh, who's a lecturer in law and, and a clinical instructor at the International Human Rights Clinic at Harvard Law School. She herself fled Myanmar uh, 32 years ago in 1988 and immigrated to Canada as a government-sponsored refugee. Since then, she's worked on gender justice issues and has been involved in, in legislation and law reform efforts to advance human rights in Myanmar. Her reports on behalf of human rights defenders, refugees, and internally displaced people and migrant communities have been submitted to the United Nations and its special rapporteurs. Uh, previously, she served as the inaugural director of Myanmar's uh, Program for Justice Trust and was selected by the Women Nobel Prize laureates to lead the first ever global campaign to stop rape and sexual violence in conflict. Our, our second uh, uh, panelist is Akila Radhakrishnan, who's the president of the Global Justice Center in New York, a nonprofit that works to define, establish, and protect human rights and gender equity by enforcing international laws that safeguard human rights and promote gender equality. She's provided legal expertise to domestic and international stakeholders and policymakers, including the International Criminal Court, the United Nations, the European Union, and national governments. Then we have Lawrence Witcher, who's the research director at the U.S. Holocaust Museum's uh, Memorial Museum, Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide, and a lecturer at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. He formerly served as Syria as senior atrocity prevention fellow with USAID, where he supported the agency's participation on the Atrocity Prevention Board uh, in the U.S. government. He's based in Washington, D.C. Now let's go to our panelists for some introductory remarks, then I'll have a question, and then we're awaiting uh, your questions for the panelists uh, to respond to. So first, uh, Yi, uh, uh, you're welcome to, to make your remarks. Thank you, Ambassador Rapp. Thank you to Physicians for Human Rights for organizing this panel. And um, it's a pleasure for me to be here to speak alongside Akila and Lawrence. While the pandemic no doubt affects all of us, I want to talk today particularly about the communities that are vulnerable to it in my country of Burton, Myanmar, namely the internally displaced persons and refugees and the conflict that still continues, which has created these conditions that put them more at greater risk. Here we are all talking about the risk of mass atrocities during a pandemic, while I'm mindful of the fact that just today in Naypyidaw, the capital of Myanmar, it's the end of day one of a planned three-day long um, Finland peace conference. The last time the civilian government, the Tamadaw, the military, as uh, Professor uh, Ambassador Rep says, and ethnic armed organizations met, that was two years ago in 2018, in what had originally been planned as a biannual meeting, but since then, peace talks have stalled and now, as we're sitting down to talk about it, um, peace talks are resuming. And despite all the pomp and circumstances that are surrounding this peace talks, and you know, there is little peace to be had in my country of birth. Despite a global ceasefire that was called in March by the UN Secretary General, the military campaign continues to this very day in ethnic regions. 
you know, in January of this year, the ICJ had tasked Myanmar to protect and prevent the risk of ongoing genocide against the Rohingya community. Um, I think the world is aware of the nearly 1 million or so Rohingyas that are residing in the refugee camps in Bangladesh, but there are actually 600,000 and more remaining behind inside Rakhine State with more than nearly 130,000 that are still confined to internment camps. Um, many of these were interned to these camps because of the 2012 violences between the Rakhine Buddhists and the Rohingya Muslims. And living in these apartheid-like conditions, they're unable to travel, access health care, um, free, uh, freely worship, pursue education, or even marry without restrictions. And, you know, as uh, Ambassador Rep said earlier, next week is going to be the th third year anniversary of the clearance operation that led to the mass exodus to Bangladesh. But since then, the violence has not subsided. And if anything, the, it has intensified in Rakhine State due to the ongoing clash between the Arakan Army, which is an, a Rakhine ethnic armed organization, and the Tamadur of the Burmese military, which resumed in 2000, December 2018. And as I mentioned earlier, the peace talks are starting, but this critical um, EAO or ethnic armed organization AA um, has been completely excluded from that peace talk. Arakan Army or AA, um, like the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army before it, has now been declared a terrorist organization. Um, and the fighting since 2018, December, has spilled over now, affecting effectively nine townships in both Rakhine State as well as Chin State, which is a neighboring state. And caught between the attacks and counterattacks of these two groups of the ethnic arm organization and the military are the Rohingya, Rakhine, and Chin civilians. And the Tamada, you know, despite being under the scrutiny of an investigation at the International Criminal Court, a potential uh, finding of genocide uh, or, con you know, uh, contravening the Genocide Convention at the ICJ level, or even a universal jurisdiction case out of Argentina has not calibrated its tactics or its brutality um, and in targeting civilians. And it's continued to perpetrate with impunity inside Myanmar the way that it operates. You know, since the conflict in Rakhine State has taken in place. Air raids continues to this day. Landmines have been placed. Um, there's shelling close to populated areas. In January, just days after the ICJ provisional measure asking Myanmar to protect, four Rohingya children and were killed and six others injured when a landmine exploded in Butitao Township. The same month, two Rohingya women, one of whom was pregnant, was killed when, you know, uh, an artillery shell hit their village in Kindao. In April, a WHO worker who was transporting COVID samples in Rakhine State was shot and killed. These clashes in populated areas have destroyed schools and homes, and civilians have fled the landmines and the shelling and the air raids, which has become all too common a practice in Rakhine State. And also the tragedy is that, you know, in addition to these uh, violations, the, it's become standard practice for the Tamadaw and AA to blame each other for these incidents. Neither party has claimed responsibility for the loss of civilian lives or even their failure to abide by principles of international humanitarian law. The UN, you know, Coordination for Humanitarian Affairs estimate that just in the last year alone, there are over 86,000 internally displaced persons in Rakhine and Chin State as a result of this conflict. This figure doesn't take into account the already 172 IDP sites that are in the north, um, given that there is a conflict also in the north, which most people may not know about in Kachin and Shan State, um, with the, the, the conflict in the north entering what is now its ninth year. And with this increasing conflict, what has happened is the increasing humanitarian assistance and the need for it. But the government of Myanmar has blocked restriction to aid. It has cut off humanitarian aid to a lot of these communities inside. And that's going to have a severe consequences for those communities in both Rakhine, Chen, not to mention, as I said, um, the communities in the north. So when COVID broke out, I thought first and foremost about these ITB communities inside Myanmar, as well as the Rohingya refugees that I work with in Cox's Bazaar. Measures that we take for granted, like social distancing, hand washing, um, which we take for granted, are next to impossible in these makeshift camps in the, villa, in, in the jungles of Myanmar, as well as the world's largest refugee camp in Bangladesh. Furthermore, you know, health information and access to health care is something that is quite challenging. Um, one of the potential tools that could use to mitigate or assist with health information is the internet, namely allowing health information to reach these communities. But instead, what has happened is that since June 2019, the internet shutdown has been placed, essentially blocking off 
uh, communities in those conflict areas for being able to communicate to the outside world or even getting information about the conflict or health information about COVID from reaching them. It's, uh, you know, over this past weekend, right before we have this conversation today, um, 2G internet was restored to four townships, but the communities on the ground are saying that, do that does nothing to fix what they really direly need, which is, you know, full restoration of rights and humanitarian aid that needs to be reaching them. And the internet shutdown is not just something that's happening in Myanmar, but it's something that's also happening in Bangladesh. Since September 2019, refugee partners are, have said that you know they've had they've been deprived of access to information, and now even with COVID, that internet shutdown and block remains in Bangladesh. So vital life saving, saving information is not reaching the Rohingya refugees in the camps. They're unable to find out about it. There's a lot of fear and misinformation. Um, many are quite afraid of and frankly telling the camp authorities if they exhibit symptoms because they're scared of being separated from their families or even being confined to them. And as I was mentioning, for the IDB camps in Myanmar, as well as the Rohingya camps, the conditions are what make the spread of the disease so real, and it's what makes them so vulnerable. Many people are, large groups are huddled in makeshift shelters made of bamboos and tarps. They're using communal toilets. There's limited drinking water or washing water. And because of that, and since the first case was detected in Cox's Bazaar in May, um, there's already been reported of six deaths, I believe 79 confirmed case, and some 15,000 communities have been um, quarantined. So I wanted to paint a picture of what the conditions are like in these, but also because of the escalating conflict and the deteriorating con uh, you know, conditions, it's causing many people to flee Myanmar still. So despite the three-year anniversary coming up on us, the peace not has, has not arrived in Myanmar and it has not stemmed the flow of human um, IDPs and refugees coming across. So for the Rohingya, many take great risk um, to their personal safety and liberty to get a life, um, a chance at a better life in neighboring countries like Bangladesh, India, Thailand, and Malaysia, to name a few. In February, uh, Rohingya refugees uh, left the refugee camps in Bangladesh, uh, bound trying to reach for ba Malaysia. Um, they're both capsized, killing 15 Rohingya refugees. Two months later, again, in April, nearly 400 emaciated Rohingya refugees, mostly women and children, they were rescued from a ship that was adrift in the Bay of Bengal. They had been at sea for nearly two months. Many were trying to reach Malaysia, but because of COVID, the authorities um, and the border restrictions, uh, despite the principles of non involvement, turned many communities away, causing uh, people similar, uh, as late as June even this year, you know, an Indonesian fisherman uh, reported finding 100 Rohingya refugees, once again, also mostly women and children weak from hunger and dehydration in a boat adrift off of Aceh. So it's unclear to us um, how many boats remain out there on the high seas, but given that the neighboring communities and the neighboring countries are closing their borders because of the pandemic, these failed attempts will only increase and likely continue. Um, and many, you know, risk uh, liberty, death, uh, as well as abuse at the hands of uh, traffickers because the situation in Rakhine is so dire and the future in Bangladesh is so uncertain. So, I mean, I wanna, you know, leave time for questions as well, but I think for the final comments I have about the risk for these communities is that as long as Myanmar civil wars continue, there's very little chance for the Rohingya refugees to return home in a safe, voluntary, or dignified manner. And this will continue to flow out of the country, whether it's huddled uh, in IDB camps in the country or as refugees trying to reach safe destination in neighboring countries. And for these communities, both the IDPs in Myanmar, the ethnic um, IDPs, as well as the refugees, what is really needed is that Myanmar Myanmar has to transform into a rights-respecting, tolerant, democratic society with rule of law, and crucial, crucial element of that is justice, as well as citizenship for Rohingya rights. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Akila. Your opening remarks? Great. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Ambassador Ralph, and, and thank you to PHR and, and Yi and Lawrence for for this panel, and of course, um, you know, we're really delighted to be here. As Ambassador Rapp mentioned, I'm the president of the Global Justice Center, an international human rights organization dedicated to advancing gender equality through the rule of law. We combine legal analysis with strategic advocacy to ensure equal protection of the law for women and girls. And it's this focus on gender that really informs my opening remarks today. So I think we've seen all around the world that COVID has helped to reveal the deep and systemic inequalities that exist everywhere and the disproportionate impact that a pandemic like COVID has on marginalized and at-risk communities, 
including women and girls. On gender, we've seen exponential increases in rates of gender-based violence, the deprioritization and interruption of essential health services needed by women and girls, including sexual and reproductive health services. And women are also bearing the brunt of unpaid care work. Um, and in the context of what we do, where we do a lot of work in conflict and mass atrocities, we see that what the pandemic is exposing is often what we see conflicts expose, those deep systemic you know, fissures in a society, the inequalities that actually inform the fall into conflict, the consequence, the consequence of conflict, and really should be at the core of how we address all types of crises, including pandemics and conflicts. Um, you know, we, we know that, um, for example, rapid increases in the prevalence of gender-based violence, which we're seeing now in the midst of a pandemic, is actually an early warning indicator of conflict and that higher rates of equality correlate with a country's stability and security. And so I think this is why when we think about this nexus between mass atrocities and other crises like COVID, we need to center gender in prevention and response efforts. And so he really helped set up um, what I wanna talk about, which is that you know, in the context of assessing what the risk of atrocities continue to look like for ethnic minorities in Myanmar, including the Rohingya, we need to actually understand in some ways what were the preconditions that allowed these um, that allowed these atrocities to be carried out, how they were carried out, because frankly, COVID has been a distraction um, in many ways for allowing the Myanmar government to continue its policies. You, you know, we kind of had this this moment in January when the ICJ issued its provisional measures order where we said their scrutiny you know they've got a report in may they've got a report again in november but what we saw in you know what we presume is in the contents of that report is that there was really just superficial measures that were taken um you know to say that they were satisfactory they issued some kind of middling um you know directives on the prevention of hate speech and on the preservation of evidence but covid has allowed myanmar to say there's actually no ability to you know there's no ability to monitor it and in fact, when the UN Security Council met in, in mid-May, shortly before the ICJ report was due, um, you know, the conversation on this closed briefing on Myanmar was entirely focused on COVID. There wasn't a conversation necessarily as we saw escalating conflict happen. We saw some states raise the issue, but you know, on the whole, what we saw was that COVID is allowing Myanmar to get away with business as usual. And so I think in order to understand this business as usual, I wanna highlight a few of the key gendered aspects and also in the context of this conversation, some of the ways in which access to healthcare was actually a part of the, the commission of mass atrocities and you know, hopefully to inform the rest of the conversation on how we move forward here. So for those, um, you know, I think we're, we can get in a little bit in the weeds. So I'm just gonna take a slight step back. So as Ambassador Rapp mentioned, you had over 700,000 Rohingya flee to Bangladesh in a meter, matter of weeks. Um, after an outbreak of massive conflict in 2017, um, and survivors reported indiscriminate killings, gender-based violence, arbitrary detention, torture, beatings, forced displacement, you know, kind of a really robust and full litany of the crimes that you see when mass atrocities are being committed. Um, and in this context, we actually saw reports of widespread pervasive and rape and sexual violence. Um, in fact, the fact-finding mission on Myanmar that was established by the United Nations found that sexual violence was in fact a hallmark of the security forces operations, um, both against the Rohingya, but actually a part of a decades long pattern that they've utilized against ethnic minorities as well. Um, and, you know, in this context, you saw that rape was being used in particularly brutal ways. Many women reported being gang raped, some by as many as eight perpetrators, eight military perpetrators. The rapes were accompanied by other acts of violence, humiliation and cruelty. Women were beaten, punched, kicked, subject to invasive body searches. Their bodies were mutilated, their breasts and nipples were cut off, their vagina slashed. And I'm getting into the details for a reason. Um, and women and girls of reproductive age were particularly targeted, but individuals were not spared by age and condition with girls as young as five and pregnant women among the victims. Um, and so, you know, the context here is really important because genocide is essentially a crime that targets the regenerative capacity of a group. And so this is why gender is such an important component of understanding what the risk of genocide means and how we respond to it. And so the manner in which sexual violence was carried out, who was targeted, why they were targeted, is at the core of how the military was committing its mass atrocities. 
And I think if we think about Myanmar and we think about what meaningful response is going to be, that's what we need to be focusing on. You know, we can't just be letting the military get, a, you know, the government get away with middling directives on, on hate speech or on the preservation of evidence. We need to be asking for real results because one of the key issues here is that nothing that underlied how the Rohingya genocide unfolded, the decades long campaign of persecution and systems and policies have been addressed. And so as we look at what this distraction of COVID enables is it enables them to ignore the fact that what they need to be doing is dismantling discriminatory frameworks, discriminatory policies, including those that restrict freedom of movement and health care. Um, and so I think that's where I'm going to stop my introductory remarks, because I think there's a lot to kind of pick up on and go on, including how they specifically tie to justice efforts. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Akila. Lawrence, uh, your remarks? Thanks, Ambassador Rapp, and thanks to PHR for bringing us together. I'll try to complement Yi and Akila's remarks uh, with a few thoughts from a kind of comparative global perspective based on some thinking and conversations we've been having at the Simon Scott Center at the Holocaust Museum. So um, three broad points to start with. First, as uh, I think Rohini um, mentioned at the top, though we're uh, right to focus on the plight of the Rohingya and the ways in which COVID is a particular threat to that population. Um, groups who have been suffering and enduring uh, mass atrocities around the world are now facing major threats from COVID-19. Um, so if we look at places like Syria, South Sudan, Cameroon, um, territories that are um, threatened by Boko Haram, uh, populations in, in all of these places are now facing this double threat of COVID-19. The, the forced displacement of populations who have been under systematic attack is um, certainly a strong uh, factor, leaving them highly vulnerable, as has already been said. They can't take the kinds of uh, common sense um, protective measures to avoid infection, um, and they have very limited access to healthcare. Uh, and more broadly, these are uh, largely very marginalized populations, even if they haven't been forcibly displaced. So uh, I think. Um, the, the manifestations of COVID-19 and the specific threats will vary across cases. We do need to recognize that um, these populations who have been suffering from mass atrocities are um, especially vulnerable across the globe. Second, I would say that in addition to these direct effects of COVID-19, there's reason to worry that the pandemic could be raising the risk uh, that new mass atrocities will begin in places where they uh, don't already exist. And this would include, but would go well beyond what has been referred to as the weaponization of the pandemic by uh, authoritarian governments. So for example, uh, the pandemic can exacerbate um, pre-existing patterns of discrimination, xenophobia, uh, and what's often called the othering of minority populations. And at, at an extreme, in certain circumstances, this can lead to widespread attacks on uh, minority groups who may be increasingly perceived as threats and dangerous to the overall population in the context of a pandemic. But even more broadly, we can think that COVID may be um, contributing to underlying conditions that raise the risk of mass atrocities. So we know that mass atrocities are more likely to occur in situations of armed conflict. Uh, we also know that COVID is having a major uh, effect on economies around the world. And when there are these kind of negative shocks to uh, to uh, economies, this uh, historically has been associated with greater risk of armed conflict outbreak. So in turn, this could lead to uh, more situations that are ripe for the kinds of atrocities that we're talking about today, even if those uh, connections are a bit indirect. The third point um, has already been alluded to, which is that uh, the pandemic could make international action to prevent and respond to mass atrocities uh, both less common and possibly less effective. Um, so we, I think, all acknowledge that uh, leaders and governments around the world, especially maybe in, in many places that we often would turn to for leadership uh, in resp responding to threats of atrocities, the U.S. and others, um, are really consumed with their domestic situations, responding to the pandemic uh, and the economic effects in their own countries. Um, so we should expect, in the very least, less attention to uh, ongoing threats of atrocities around the world. 
Um, of course, the economic effects of the pandemic also put pressure on, on budgets in, in governments and international organizations. Uh, and this would include various kinds of foreign assistance um, that sometimes can be used effectively to address uh, risks of atrocities. And then furthermore, uh, if we think about some of the kinds of uh, tools and strategies that can uh, potentially help address threats of atrocities, things like mediation, national dialogues, uh, documentation of human rights abuses, uh, deployment of peacekeeping operations, um, some of these are significantly complicated by the pandemic, just by virtue of the difficulty of, uh, of congregating large groups of people together, um, especially bringing people from different parts of the world together. Uh, and so this can either put a, uh, a constraint on the ability to use these tools uh, at all, or when they may be used in any case, uh, may decrease their effectiveness. So I think all of this together should raise our concerns. Um, but at the same point, I just would end with a, a call for humility. This is, a, a, in many ways, a, an unprecedented uh, global crisis. Um, and we need to be realistic about our ability to forecast the specific kinds of effects in specific places. Thanks. Well, thank you very much to all the panelists. I, I had prepared some, uh, some initial questions before we go to the audience questions, which I see are, are, are already uh, coming in. And uh, I think some of the questions I was going to ask have been answered by the panelists already. But just to, uh, to, add, uh, to add, add, add at least one or, or two for each uh, uh, that, that were raised by my prepared questions, which you've seen. Um, for, for Yi, um, the, the question that I think a lot of us have when we talk about weaponization is whether the military is, is using this as, as a means to, to some extent to hide what it's doing. We, we know the military is carrying on these uh, battles with uh, ethnic armies, uh, you know, uh, for, de for decades and, 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 and really uh, uh, doing it often by attacking the civilian population under this tactic that they separate the, these groups from the civilians that are suspected of supporting them. Uh, but, it, but in terms of the brutality of those operations and what they're doing, are they, are they taking advantage of this? Uh, uh, the absence of visibility really push that uh, harder, even while they sit down finally in these negotiations. And, and related to that is the Rohingya issue, because it is distinguishable from the other. Uh, obviously, we have the Arakan army, and there's the, the Rakhine Buddhist population and others that, that are unhappy about uh, the, the central control. That have largely motivated that movement, but when it comes to the to the Rohingya, a Muslim community, and, and the citizenship law, and the way that the, uh, the military uh, and the government have proceeded uh, on this grounds of exclusion, of, of, of saying that these aren't one of the ethnic groups, uh, they're not uh, entitled to sit at the table. We're not going to make any negotiation with them. We, we get them out. Uh, uh, but at the same time, they're, they're saying to the international community, oh, we want to repatriate these people. Mm -hmm. But you know, what are we seeing in terms of making that repatriation possible? Uh, are they really just sort of burning the bridge uh, by, by all their actions? I mean, so, so I'm interested in kind of the relevance of how they're using this kind of time period uh, uh, to actually uh, uh, make their crimes worse, to be frank. Thank you, Ambassador Rapp. Um, so for, with regards to your first point about the weaponization and, you know, is the military hiding what it's doing? Is it taking advantage of this moment in time to sort of increase its persecution and oppression of the ethnic nationality? I think there's definitely that is one of the things that is clearly manifesting in this period at a time when, you know, ethnic armed organization, and I'm not talking about the Arakan army, they've treated that and what's happening in Rakhine as a totally different separate case, but rather, you know, co the Karen community, the Karen army, the KNU and the KNPB, which is the Karen community, when these ethnic armed organizations and the ones in the North are saying, let's have a global ceasefire per, you know, this is the mandate coming out of March 23rd from the uh, Secretary General, this is something we should all hunker down. Despite the, you know, uh, unilateral proposal, it's something that the Tamidar rejected right up until May. They were still engaging. Um, and one of the questions I think from, from the audience was around, you know, is there government interference? There's definitely because in a lot of these ethnic regions, the Ministry of Health and, you know, the health public access is quite limited. A, a lot of it is centralized in the, the Buddhist Burman regions, but in the ethnic communities, a lot of the ethnic armed organization plus their health authorities are responsible for it. And we 
saw as this pandemic broke, um, checkpoints that were set up by ethnic communities and ethnic armed organizations to test their communities, to spread health information, which were attacked by the Burmese military. So for a regime that claims to say that it's taking the lead and it's wrapping it up in this sort of patriotism of we're going to protect everyone and leave no nation, nobody behind in this country, you know, spearheading this campaign, I think the action speaks louder than words. So I think there's definitely that degree and they're taking advantage of it. Now, in Rakhine, the, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, the whole other case, not only has there been no cessation of hostilities, it's been amped up. And then with regards to specifically the Rohingya community, um, you, you know, the patterns that Akila mentioned, and we've seen it all through the fact-finding mission and the, you know, gut-wrenching testimony coming out of the refugees in the the, the many of us who've been immersed in this work, um, it, the, the compounding factor for the Rohingya is that up until 82, they were deemed equal citizens. And then you have Nguyen, the former military dictator, declaring all of a sudden this new 1982 citizenship law, which plays this arbitrary distinction that they're not part of Myanmar because they were somehow brought in by British colonialism. So overnight, these communities who were once full citizens um, that were able to participate in parliament, be engaging in politics, were to Deprive of that and confined to this, you know, the, one of the poorest state in the, an already poor country, um, no longer being allowed to freely move, access health care, as I had mentioned. So now the cycle of, you know, fighting oppression against the Rohingya, causing them to flee across the border to Bangladesh, this is not something that's new. Perhaps for the international community, this might be like, wow, it happened three years ago or something. But this has been happening since 82 onwards, and waves of Rohingya communities have fled to Bangladesh. And time and time again, bilateral agreements have been struck up between Bangladesh and Myanmar to return them. And each of these vicious cycles ends when ultimately more oppression more running across the border. So th this is what I talk about when I say durable solution. Peace has to be a part of it. So does citizenship rights, because until then, you're just letting these patterns repeat itself throughout history. So um, I hope I've answered your questions with regards to that point. Yeah, very, very well. And I, it's, it overlaps what I was going to ask uh, uh, Akila, and I know uh, Akila's been actively involved in the saw in the Hague during the, uh, uh, the International Court of Justice arguments on the uh, Gambia versus uh, Myanmar. Uh, but, uh, but, and of course that case turns on the question of genocide. And uh, I know from my own experience of the Rwanda tribunal where we uh, won the uh, first judgment to enact Aesu, uh, where the, the rape and sexual violence were found to be means by which uh, serious injury was inflicted on the community, uh, uh, it, sufficient uh, to, to be part of the act of committing the genocide, the destruction of that community, even if the, the direct victims weren't killed. And, and that was such an important decision. But, you know, what do we see uh, in, in, in what's happened uh, since uh, 2017 and what's happening during COVID, uh, uh, Akilah, that's, that's relevant to this genocide uh, determination, one, uh, whether we've got an ongoing uh, uh, commission of genocide, and two, uh, the issue that I know Lawrence is so focused on, which is the prevention and, mm -hmm. and, and whether... Uh, uh, the, this government uh, and its military arm are taking action to prevent uh, uh, genocide. Great, thanks so much, Stephen. Um, it's you know it's been a really interesting time working on Myanmar. Our organization's actually been working on Myanmar and, and at, with Yi for a very long time, but you know since about 2005. And one of the things that I think has to be noted, and this is not just about the Rohingya, is that impunity is absolutely the norm in Myanmar. There has been the calls for justice from ethnic organizations, women's rights organizations that we've worked with are decades long. And that's because there's structural barriers inside Myanmar that really prevent the ability of any sort of domestic justice from happening. And that includes the constitution that grants impunity to military actors, a really you know, terrible set on the gender front, um, you know, an, a rape law that dates from 1861, and uh, what are we at now, you seven years in, in the process of trying to get a new violence against women law um, that, that they keep weakening. And so, you know, that's one of the, I think the fights that's characterized the, the human rights struggle in Myanmar is it's been a consistent call. And even in 2011, 2012, as you saw what felt like a hopeful moment of a transition, you just saw justice deprioritized. You saw the international community deprioritize justice. And, you know, so I think that it's really important that we grapple with that. And, 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 in, and in kind of an in, 
interesting and exciting moment in November of last year, we all of a sudden saw three international justice processes open up. The first one was a state responsibility case um, that you mentioned, Stephen, at the International Court of Justice brought by the Gambia. You also saw the ICC um, authorize the opening of an investigation into particular crimes related to the um, kind of crimes that completed themselves in Bangladesh as a result of the jurisdictional issues. And then Yi mentioned this universal jurisdiction case in Argentina. All of those cases are focused on the Rohingya. And I will talk about that for a second, but I think it's important that as we talk about this broader risk of atrocity prevention, we need to make sure that international efforts um, do take into account the need for justice for all ethnic minorities. Um, and the fact of the matter is sexual violence, I discussed it in the context of the Rohingya, it is you see very similar patterns across the conflicts with all ethnic groups. Um, specifically, as it relates to the case of the Rohingya, November was exciting. It felt like we finally were seeing a breakthrough in this moment of impunity, a way of trying to address this, this issue that I think is so fundamentally important to the safe and voluntary repatriation, as well as the Rohingya, because there's no way for them to go home if the military that committed crimes against them, that committed a genocidal campaign, remains in power. They've seen no one be punished for it. Um, and I think, unfortunately, what COVID has brought is delays. Uh, um, and so this is going to be one of the things, is the fact is we're in this moment in time fully clustered in a space where international accountability seems to be the only option. And we've already seen the impact of COVID. So a few months ago, the Gambian legal team, and fully understandably, actually asked for an extension to file their their uh, first memorials in the ICJ case. And so now the kind of filings from both parties are not actually going to happen until mid next year. The IIIM Nick Kunjin's team, which was set up by the United Nations, has also noted that the inability to travel to the region has impacted their ability to build cases and gather evidence. And we've seen the same thing from the ICC. So I think that, you know, we really need to be grappling with what these delays mean and how we can still push these international processes forward because they're so fundamental to return um, and you know try to do what can be done to to help continue the momentum and keep keep these going um, and i think i'll just quickly kind of complete you know conclude with going back to my first point around the distraction issues so as accountability has you know is, is kind of chugging along one of the key pieces was in january the icj ordered Myanmar to take measures, proactive measures, to prevent genocide from occurring against the Rohingya. And that could, you know, as a, this is a part of a justice process. But what that gets to is that Myanmar really should be taking steps in this moment to dismantle some of the discriminatory frameworks that Yi has talked about. This includes the citizenship law. It also includes in the context of women and the Rohingya restrictions on marriage, restrictions on the number of children that they can have that are enabled by laws and policies, like the 2015 population control law, for example. Um, you know, the closure of the camps where the Rohingya live in internment, which also is, you know, going to exacerbate potentially the, the context of COVID, um, and increasing humanitarian access, because one of the major ways that Myanmar has been able to get away with everything, and they will continue to get away with everything, is they've restricted access to international independent monitors and for humanitarian orgs to be providing services. Um, and so I think that, you know, as a part of this justice continuum, as we see the formality of the process still talk along, we need to be using these opportunities to be pushing for the meaningful change that can also, you know, come out of these processes. Thank you very much, Akila. Uh, Lawrence, uh, and I don't want to uh, get too far afield, but uh, the question we talked about earlier were examples from past pandemics or epidemics where mass atrocity prevention has been a concern. I mean, uh, every situation is different. Uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but as Mark Twain said, it, it, it rhymes. And, 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 and we've certainly, I know, seen the rhetoric uh, in the past, this otherization that you've spoken to, uh, sometimes re referring to the other as vermin or disease carriers or, the, or that kind of thing. But uh, what, what have we learned from those experiences and, and, how, and how effectively uh, uh, can the international community counter uh, the, the, those efforts to, to otherize and to associate uh, uh, particular groups uh, with disease uh, and by doing that justify uh, a violent action against them? Yeah, I think it's important that we do study these past cases, both of uh, pandemics and disease outbreaks, as well as uh, other kinds of 
uh, complex emergencies um, that might approximate the current uh, COVID pandemic in, in some ways, um, even including uh, global economic shocks that, that have these kind of reverberations. Um, but I, I would say that from our uh, review of what's been studied, the, um, there aren't a lot of clear findings about the connection between pandemics and mass atrocities per se. There are these fairly consistent patterns uh, about exacerbating discrimination and typically, as has already been noted, marginalized groups tend to, to bear the brunt of these kinds of uh, health crises. Um, and there's also a fairly consistent uh, pattern of um, sort of budding autocrats uh, seizing on these emergencies to uh, consolidate their rule, to uh, restrict uh, freedoms of various kinds, um, and uh, move towards a more kind of consolidated authoritarian uh, governance structure. Um, I would say, though, it is important to note that these kinds of negative effects aren't inevitable. They don't occur with every case of either a, a pandemic or another kind of crisis uh, or emergency. Um, and uh, there are examples where we see communities coming together as opposed to fracturing when faced with this kind of um, external shock. Uh, I would say um, it's hard to pin, um, pin down specific strategies for the international community to help uh, avoid the the negative effects, but I think uh, in many ways the, the key mediating factors are at the local and national levels. Um, what is the level of social cohesion that pre-exists within a community? Are there uh, broader identities that bring people together that they can uh, see a, a commonality across um, the, the narrower ethnic or religious lines? Um, and do they have trust in their elites and the, the governing authorities? Um, and do those authorities have the capabilities and, and the ability to uh, respond to the health crises in ways that are effective? Uh, when there's distrust, when there's a lack of capability, uh, then the attempts to um, respond to the health crisis will, uh, will typically exacerbate the kinds of, um, the, the kinds of feelings that will um, you know, create uh, greater um, fissures and uh, conflicts between these communities and between people and their governments, um, which uh, can then, you know, again, at, at the extreme lead to this sort of authoritarian uh, crackdown. Well, well, thank you very much, Lawrence. Now, we have a number of questions that have come in and, and, and not a lot of time left. Uh, I, I see a couple that uh, perhaps I'll ask you about that, that focus on what's actually happening with COVID uh, and uh, the Rohingya. Uh, both in, in, in country, uh, in the IDPs, in, in, among the IDPs in the camps that you described, uh, and also outside them, the 600,000 Rohingya that still live in, in Rakhine State, in Northern Rakhine, and, uh, and whether with the military taking the lead, uh, there's actually programs for, for testing and, and for, for treatment and for isolation and quarantining and, and contact tracing and all of that, whether that kind of thing is occurring at all and, and then going over to the other side of the border, where we have hundreds of thousands in, in these camps, and, and, and the resources available uh, from the international community are limited, and uh, the funding is insufficient, and, and, but yet the testing that we've had to date uh, indicates a relatively low rate of, of COVID infection. Um, uh, how, what do we make of that? Uh, is this uh, perhaps accurate, but also maybe uh, an indication that it's only beginning to move in that community? And, and how is, what, what does the international community need to, to do to truly protect uh, these individuals uh, uh, that, that are the victims and survivors of this crime and, and prevent those who, who really wanted to destroy them from, from accomplishing that and uh, through this disease? Yeah, Ambassador Rapp, I think that the figures are something that I would take with a huge grain of salt, honestly, on both sides of the border. Early on in the COVID pandemic, Myanmar had this sort of nationalist stance that we were somehow spared from the COVID infection that was affecting the world because of our diet and culture and all that. Um, and now you suddenly start seeing this shift. Um, and I think uh, in case it hasn't been alluded, now the dialogue, even when the first COVID cases started coming and was being reported, this narrative was around that it wasn't actually from Myanmar. It was actually brought in by returnees um, from England and the United States. And now of late, the disturbing trend of, you know, illegal interlopers and um, not, they refuse to call the Rohingya the Rohingya, the illegal Bengalis who are 
coming back across the border and bringing this disease back, I think has been mentioned. Um, and I think that's really problematic and sets this sort of uh, pitting of communities, which Lauren's just saying, you know, to try to tear at the social cohesion and the communities that need to be really coming together. And I think even in the best scenarios, even for the Buddhist Burman community that is the most privileged in the society, the health infrastructure in Myanmar is severely lacking. I think in, in the World Health Organization's ranking, it ranked something like 190 out of 191 nations. So there's not really tests capacity, much less coordinated effect about isolation and treatment plan. And you can take that starting baseline point and add to that layers of the deprivations and the violations of rights in places like Rakhine State in the in IDP internment camps, as well as the newly, you know, 86 something thousand people, which are Rakhine, Chin, and Rohingya who have had to flee. Um, I think the, the, the situation is bleak. And I earlier in my presentation reported how there is some, you know, like World Health Organization, Myanmar-based uh, INGOs that are trying to get access, but overall humanitarian aid and access of foreign aid workers being allowed in these regions are very limited. Um, the WHO staff who was killed was a Myanmar WHO staff who was transporting COVID samples that they could gather and no one's taking responsibility for that. On the other side of the border in Bangladesh, um, what has happened is because of COVID, a lot of the international agencies and a lot of staff have fled, left the, the, the country. Um, a lot of the Rohingya partners that I work with report how now the camps are just the Bangladesh authorities and camp authorities and them. And even then, you know, they still have to line up for food and, uh, and water and supplies. Um, there's still that internet blockage that doesn't mean information. Families are still confined to very cramped spaces sharing that. So, you know, we have limited aid, uh, you know, compared to the IDP camps in Myanmar, perhaps there's a degree in which aid is reaching these communities. But that aid is also severely hampered by so many of these um, variables of, of, you know, the community that's, and, and I think we, at the longer this protracted um, stay in Bangladesh goes on, the, you know, the least likely that the international community is able to have the resources necessary or, you know, they're prioritizing something else. So I think it's all these factors that make uh, particularly the IDPs, the refugees um, at risk and something that we, you know, can't forget um, when all this is happening in addition to the human rights violation and the conflict. Well, let me, I, we're, we're approaching the end of this. I, I've, I, we have questions here on, on the political future, political situation in, in Myanmar, also on what can be done in terms of accountability. Uh, let me just uh, combine those two and, and the question specifically asked about what happens if the NLD uh, loses power. Obviously, a lot of us are disappointed in the NLD and we had Aung San Suu Kyi uh, defending the disgraceful actions of, of, of our military in, in, in The Hague. Um, but obviously, um, you know, if it's diminished, uh, the ability to, to do anything positive may be diminished and, and there could be greater risk against the uh, you know, and dealing with the 600,000 uh, uh, in, in country and, and, and further clearance operations motivated by trying to deal with this terrorist threat and, and uh, you know, trying to make these, uh, uh, even the ARSA, which was a, a negligible force into some kind of Al Qaeda uh, uh, to justify it. I mean, it, it, are we looking at that? And then as, as, we, as we look to the future, even if, you know, we should have obviously been doing things before 2017, uh, and we thought engagement with the government was going to do that, and it, and, it didn't, and it didn't work. These crimes occurred. What is it that we can effectively do? I mean, obviously, uh, cases uh, uh, at the ICC without getting arrests will be challenging. ICJ, obviously, it's great that the country is in that process and will get a holding eventually. Um, extraterritorial cases, hard to get anybody arrested. Uh, but, you know, there are other things, the sanctions, uh, the Magnitsky, global Magnitsky kind of sanctions can be implemented by the United States, now by Europe, by UK, hard to do in the UN because of China's blockage, uh, but not against the people, but against, uh, against the military, against their businesses, against others. You know, what, what is it that we can be more effective uh, to try to send a clear signal that uh, uh, this, these, these crimes don't pay <laughs> and, and that there are consequences and, 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 and hopefully prevent uh, uh, them in the future and begin to achieve justice for the uh, for the victims and survivors. So let me just uh, yield to whoever wants to jump in and, and we've got uh, uh, three or four minutes to do it. Keila? I could maybe, oh sorry, go ahead. 
No, I was going to say, Akila, you should okay. take I, I can start. I can at least take a start of a couple things that occurred to me. I mean, I think the first thing is you mentioned the election. So one is in the context of who's winning, but I think we also, as we talk about the election, there's a couple of things that are really concerning. Over the last few weeks, we've seen that Rohingya candidates that have applied to uh, to run in the elections have actually been rejected. Um, and so, you know, we need to be thinking about the international community's engagement in these elections to be making sure that one, Rohingya candidates are allowed to run in the election, that the Rohingya are able to vote. Because what you also have is a massive disenfranchisement of the Rohingya. And, and so what you're also going to see is, especially those who fled, is you're not going to see their, their ability to vote and actually vote for people who represent their interests. Um, and so I think that as we think about what needs to be done right now, there needs to be extra pressure. We, should, we can't, we, what we've seen as a consequence of having too much faith in Aung San Suu Kyi is that one person cannot change an entire country with a structure that is that essentially you know keeps the military in power and then someone who doesn't necessarily actually care that much about women and or ethnic minorities um, and so i think that you know the international community needs to stop this blind faith necessarily in nld and in Aung San Suu Kyi and make sure that in the fullness of the efforts that they're supporting including around elections they need to make sure that all ethnic minorities have the ability to participate, that COVID is not used as an excuse um, to disenfranchise people, because much like the US elections, the Burmese elections are also happening in, in that first week of November. Um, and so we still have what the threat of the pandemic will look like in terms of voting. So I think that's one thing that I would, you know, what I would want to see on the elections. There's, and then there's two other things as we think about what can be done. The first one is, um, and this did not get enough attention, the fact-finding mission on Myanmar came up, came out with a report on the economic interests of the military. And so when we think about what can be done um, outside of just these justice processes, we need to take very seriously what this economic interest report said, which really looked at and talked about what are the economic, you know, the military owns and has investments in and through crony companies, a massive amount of the what the result of the opening up of Myanmar's economy after 2011 looks like. Um, and the FFM tracked what these were, who these companies are, and said that if we don't reduce the, the financial independence of the military, we're never actually going to be the, able to address the structures that keep them in power. And so I think that we need to take very seriously what the recommendations in that FFM report were um, if we're to really try to figure out what the longer term systemic solution is. And the last thing I will say is, and, I, and this is an area that we work on a lot as an organization based in New York, is that you've seen kind of failed leadership out of the UN Security Council. You know, we kind of take it as a defeatist moment that China will veto anything and therefore it's not even worth trying anymore. You know, there has not been an open briefing of the Security Council on the situation of Myanmar since 20, I believe it's uh, early 2018. Um, and so all of the conversations the Security Council is having, who's briefing them, what is being said is being held behind closed doors. And I think there's a real need to show that because we've seen that Myanmar does actually respond to international pressure, that there's actually a real need to try to open up and have more transparency about these conversations and really think through what is possible to do to get them to shift and change. You, you had uh, something to add. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, you know, one of the, the things when we talk about beyond just sanctions, there's a lot that the global community can be doing and it's not doing. Um, there's been a lot of documentation, but yet the expectation is for the community to, you know, come forth. And I think there's enough evidence there and all these justice mechanisms are going, but you could put a global arms treaty on it. China, Russia. Israel are big sellers of weapons to the Myanmar army. Uh, Akila, I'm glad you touched on the point, like hit them where it hurts, which is the financial side of it. They control so much capital. The reason why there's a conflict ongoing in the north is the huge swaths of you know m minerals like jade in the Kachin state mm -hmm. that the army wants control of. And the communities there are trying to fight for their self, you know, um, sovereignty and trying to go towards and I think the international community could be assisting beyond just a, a passion project behind one woman or one party but really to let Myanmar achieve its vision of a democratic constitutional federal country with ethnic communities including you know every uh, ethnic nationalities in the country being allowed to have a say in their culture in their rights in their land as well as resources and I think those are the things that are not 
as much being discussed. And the, the resource piece, as well as the larger neighbors, such as China's, who's really looking to Myanmar as its backyard, where they have all these macro projects planned, even in conflict areas like Rakhine. I think there's attention that needs to be paid to those. There's global arms treaty, there's travel sanctions, there's a lot of administrative tool that I hope that people will resort to, but to also not just abandon and isolate, but really help foster and build so that that transition, the genuine democracy can actually happen in Myanmar too. I, I think we've reached the top of the hour. Lawrence, do you have anything uh, brief to add? And otherwise just, we'll turn it back to Rohini. Yeah, just very quickly, I'd say, Stephen, to your point, how to make sure that these crimes don't pay. We need to pay equal attention to how we shape uh, countries so that people don't actually contemplate committing atrocities. They don't see it as something that's in their interest. And that, I think, is, means a pivot to prevention. Uh, and, and there, I think, actually, the pandemic could be um, helpful in as much as it emphasizes and reinforces that actually acting early to try to address vulnerabilities and increase the uh, sort of good governance agenda um, and so forth um, actually should have mutual benefits both for the health and human rights uh, and atrocity prevention agenda. Well, thank you. Rohini, uh, we're, we've gone over time. I hope not too long. No, not at all. And I think it was really valuable. I have to say, uh, listening to all of you, I think when I came into this discussion, I was thinking about the crimes that are actively committed and the mass atrocities that are being hidden by being distracted. And if you call those crimes actively committed, then what I'm learning today is that there's a whole nother group of crimes of omission, of, you know, avoiding getting vital statistics, of, um, of not providing services, of being discriminatory. That, that actually compound and add cumulative effects and, and that together um, it's even more concerning and is more of a call to action. So uh, thank you so much for, for all of the comments and for all the panelists and Ambassador Rapp as well. So I just want uh, to mention that on Thursday, August 27th, we'll have our 22nd webinar at 1 p.m. Uh, please join Physicians for Human Rights for a conversation on policing and public health. Our moderator will be Dr. Mary Bassett, who's the director of the Francois Xavier Bagnoud Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard. The panelists there will be Dr. Rhea Boyd, who's a pediatrician and a public health advocate, and the chief medical officer of San Diego. Mark Krupanski, who's a senior program officer at the Open Society Foundation. And Teresa Rayford, who's the founder of Don't Shoot Portland. You can join by registering at the link posted in the webinar chat, it should be posted right now. Thank you all for being with us for such an insightful conversation. And we look forward to many more as um, this, the fall continues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Bye. Bye.